Hi, everybody. Welcome to the July 2024 CTSS quiz. I have 10 excellent cases for you as we're in the middle of summertime. And without any other comments, let's just get started. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do I see on the axials and coronal views? There's an infiltrating process involving the upper two-thirds of the left kidney. Now, this is arterial phase imaging, but this lesion is not vascular. It's probably best defined as infiltrative. There's a little bit of function in the lower pole of the left kidney. This could be lymphoma. Lymphoma can be infiltrating. Usually it involves the entire kidney, but can involve portions of the kidney, can be single or multiple lesions, but is usually bilateral, but it could be. This could be a renal cell carcinoma, an infiltrating type, maybe a papillary rather than a clear cell. More likely, and in fact what this is, is transitional cell carcinoma. It's infiltrating the kidney, the area of the calyces are distorted, it's a large, bulky transitional cell carcinoma with a small periodic node. The thing this is least likely is an abscess. Now, abscesses have all sorts of appearance, but they're typically hypodense, but often cystic. You often will see changes in the peri and pararenal space with an abscess. The sharp margins of this, the lack of increased size, the appearance, is most consistent with transitional carcinoma and a renal abscess is the least likely possibility. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, when you look at the non-contrast axial and coronal views, you see extensive calcification in what seems to be the calyces. Now you could answer under what's likely renal calcifications. I guess that's true, so you can get PAR credit, you can't argue. TB can have calcifications, but the kidneys are typically small or scarred. Renal infarction, again, um, with renal infarction, what you're going to see is loss of cortex, maybe edema early, but you're not going to see these diffuse calcifications in the pattern this patient has it. This appearance is classic for medullary sponge kidney. Bilateral mashing the calyces, a really good diagnosis. Let me also add here that medullary sponge kidney is a malformation that generally becomes manifest with nephrocalcinosis and recurrent renal stones. Other signs may be renal acidification and concentration defects precalocele ductal ectasia, and neglected proximal tubular defects. Medullary sponge kidney is generally considered a sporadic disorder. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, what I see here is a bulky ulcerating gastric mass. This could be lymphoma. Lymphoma has a range of appearances. They're usually uh, the bulky and you see large nodes. This is not the appearance of a GIST tumor, though GIST tumors can be intraluminal, so I couldn't exclude it. They usually aren't so long, quite frankly. This is not gastritis. The most likely diagnosis here is a bulky gastric adenocarcinoma, which this was. But I have to admit, if you said lymphoma, I couldn't argue with you. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, we see a large mass infiltrating the upper pole of the left kidney. It seems to involve the spleen, the uh, adrenal bed, possibly extending to stomach and periodic region. You see adenopathy. This could be a renal cell, but there's more of an infiltrating process than we typically see with a renal cells, surely clear cell. Meds to the kidney usually a well-defined single or multiple. And oncocytomas are typically well-defined. Lymphoma of the kidney, however, can be very large, can be infiltrating, can involve other adjacent organs. There's a range of appearances for lymphoma, from solitary to multiple masses. Often it's bilateral, but peri- and pararenal space involvement is not uncommon, which indeed was the case in this patient. The syndrome most likely associated with this scan is, well, what do I see? I see multiple renal masses. And if you look carefully, they have fat density. There are multiple angiomyolipomas of the kidney. 
That doesn't occur with MEN1 or MEN2. It doesn't occur with von Hippel-Lindau disease. We see cysts in the kidney as well as renal cell carcinomas, but not angiomyolipomas. That's typically associated with tuberous sclerosis. You'll often see uh, changes in the lung as well, but tuberous sclerosis is the correct answer. In this patient with increasing back pain, what's the most likely diagnosis? This is kind of a tricky case. There's roughly a five centimeter mass. It's in the adrenal pushing down on the left kidney. It's somewhat vascular and it's solid. You could think about hemorrhage, but then you gotta think what is the underlying mass? Pheochromocytomas are typically hypervascular. This has some vascularity, not the extent we typically would like to see with a pheo. Ganglion neuromas are typically of lower CT attenuation. So that kind of leaves us with a solid mass that's vascular, looks concerning, and this was a primary adrenal carcinoma. It's a good example showing you that primary ACCs are not always going to be very large tumors. In this patient with right upper quadrant pain, what's the most likely diagnosis? If you look at this mass, it's the adrenal. It has some higher density centrally, but it's mainly fat, and that's going to be an adrenal myolipoma. The high density is going to be hemorrhage. Remember, with adrenal myolipomas, they're typically going to be resected when they're five centimeters or better because of propensity to bleed, and this was eventually resected. It's not a ganglioneuroma, which is solid. It's not lymphoma, which is solid. And ACCs occasionally can have some fat, but that's usually related to the extensive extension of tumor into the perirenal and periadrenal space. So this is a very nice example of what I would call a giant adrenal myelolipoma. The least likely diagnosis in this case, again, least likely. Well, I see a mass in the liver and the mass has bled. There's blood in the perirenal space. The most common thing you need to think about, and there's a mass there, is hepatoma. You can also have metastasis like neuroendocrine tumor. And in fact, this was a neuroendocrine tumor case that metastasized to the liver and had a spontaneous bleed. Hepatic adenomas are the things we think about most when we talk about bleeding. Remember, hepatic adenomas can be benign. Others can become malignant. Hemangiomas, on the other hand, rarely bleed. First of all, this doesn't have the appearance of hemangioma, but the only hemangiomas I've seen bleed are those that were biopsied. So that's the least likely diagnosis. And as I mentioned, this was a peanut with bleeding. In this patient with a recent Whipple's procedure, the most likely diagnosis is, well, what I see is perfusion changes left lobe of the liver and also in portions of the right lobe. There are multiple air bubbles that go along the biliary tree. This is not a normal post-Whipple CT. And this is not tumor necrosis. There was no tumor in the liver. They wouldn't have operated, obviously. This could be a liver abscess, but the sharp margins really are consistent with liver infarction. Now, liver infarcts can go on to become liver abscesses. So I'll give you some credit, but the best answer here, particularly with the other lesions in the right lobe, is going to be a infarct of the liver. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, and again, least likely. I see an infiltrating tumor in the hilum of the liver with dilated ducts. To me, the most likely diagnosis here would be a cholangiocarcinoma. Now, hepatomas can be solid masses, but usually don't cause duct obstruction, but they can. And occasionally, we'll see lymphoma as bulky masses, and they too can cause dilated ducts. In fact, to our surprise, we thought this was a cholangio. On biopsy, this ended up being a B-cell lymphoma, causing duct dilatation. The one thing this is not is sclerosing cholangitis. You see some duct dilatation. You don't see a big common duct. And also, there's a large mass present. Now, some patients with sclerosing cholangitis will have an increased incidence of developing malignancy, but that's not the case here. The, the least likely diagnosis was sclerosing cholangitis. Well, those are 10 excellent cases. I hope you got them all right. I hope you learned some critical facts, and I hope to see you next month. Catch you later. 
If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.